Before serial killer Eugene Barrett took his final victim in 1995, he had already been in prison for murder twice, but had been released early each time. When the parole board decided to let Eugene go, they were effectively giving a death sentence to two women at the same time. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder, Brief and Bingeable True Crime. I'm Joe, the host, and thank you for joining today. And I've been getting a pretty regular influx of people messaging and emailing, letting me know that they just started listening and they're binging on previous episodes, and someone they know told them about the podcast, which means many of you are doing the thing that I mentioned, which is telling others about 10-Minute Murder. So thank you for that. If you are new, be sure that at some point during the next few minutes, you find and hit the subscribe button. On social media, you can connect with 10 Minute Murder and see all of the visuals that go along with the episodes. I don't post graphic or disrespectful photos of the victims there. Links for Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are in the show notes, or just as easy if you want to type 10 Minute Murder into the search bar of those places and you'll see it. Now, let's get to today's story. Born on June 30, 1931, in Oakland, California, Eugene Barrett was the firstborn son of Howard and Emily. Considering what kind of person Eugene grew up to be, it would be pretty interesting to know what was going on during his childhood, if anything, but his early years are kind of a mystery. He did, however, study at the Washington Intermediate School in Honolulu until he dropped out in the ninth grade. In his 20s, Eugene fought in the Korean War, but because he liked to drink a little bit too much, He was kicked out of the army in 1955. Eugene decided to permanently call Honolulu, Hawaii his home. At some point, Eugene got involved with a woman named Annie Phillips, a divorced mother of five children. And there's not much known about the relationship itself and how long it lasted, but eventually Annie, like the army, got fed up with his heavy drinking and dumped him in 1959. Eugene, who didn't really see a problem with his own behavior, He didn't take the rejection so well. So instead of just moving on, Eugene hopped on a bus one day, traveled to Annie's apartment complex in Mayor Wright Holmes, forced his way in, marched right into the bedroom where his ex-girlfriend was taking care of her youngest child, and shot her to death. In this guy's mind, shooting a woman in front of her young children was the way that you get over a heartbreak. Eugene was arrested immediately because the neighbors who had heard the gunshots were able to hold him down until the police arrived. During his trial, Eugene claimed that he had been blackout drunk when he killed his ex-girlfriend and never really meant to do it. And yet, witnesses heard him saying Annie deserved it. So Eugene's poor excuses didn't do his case any good, and overwhelming evidence secured his conviction and life imprisonment, which was later reduced to 15 to 50 years. This is where the story could have ended, but if it did, this would be the shortest episode ever. For some unknown reason, then-Governor John A. Byrne thought it was a great idea to commute Eugene's sentence to eight years. So in 1967, this man who had executed a woman in front of her children was free again, but not for long. Considering Eugene was able to get married in February of 1971, He likely knew how to at least pretend to be a nice guy. But eventually, the real Eugene came out, and the marriage with Roberta Alviero ended in less than two years, in November 1972. And just like it had happened with Annie, Eugene didn't care about sitting down and thinking about what went wrong and perhaps what he could do to improve as a person and a partner. Instead, Eugene took a kitchen knife and went to the Hawaii hotel where his ex-wife was staying at the time and stabbed Roberta multiple times. And again, Eugene was arrested soon after, and this time, he just pleaded guilty right away to reduce the charge to manslaughter. He was given a 10-year sentence, which is not a lot of time for a person who has killed two people, but of course, the parole board again decided Eugene was not a threat anymore after just four years and let him out. 
This time around, Eugene did live a pretty quiet life in his apartment complex for years without incidents, despite his continued excessive drinking. But eventually, Eugene is going to Eugene, and he started having issues with his neighbor, 41-year-old Danisha Roxanne Kastner. Nobody really knew the nature of their relationship, but Eugene sometimes talked about how Roxanne mocked him by dating other men and indecently exposed herself in front of him. In turn, Roxanne's friends said she would sometimes call and hysterically claim Eugene was going to harm her. Eventually, the situation got bad enough for Eugene to voluntarily be admitted for psychiatric treatment at the Queen's Medical Center, which did absolutely nothing to make things better. As soon as Eugene was released in August of 1995, he was back to his old routine. But by the time that Eugene returned, Roxanne had moved to a neighboring apartment, which happened to be across the street, but Eugene didn't know that. For one reason or another, Eugene had thought that Roxanne moved away altogether and got even angrier with her because of that. Then, on August 11th, after drinking most of the day, Eugene went to get more alcohol from the local store and saw Roxanne entering her apartment. Eugene reacted by marching back home to get his 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol before walking right past Roxanne's own son to her apartment and shooting her twice in the head. The following day, Eugene entered the Columbia Inn and asked the manager to call the police so that he could surrender. Needless to say, Eugene's third arrest caused public outrage. Nowadays, a person with a similar record would never get paroled in the same way. There would be so much media attention, and nobody really understands how the decisions for Eugene's release were made in the first place. Roxanne's seven-year-old son testified against Eugene in the preliminary hearings, being one of the youngest witnesses to take the stand in the state's history. During the trial itself, Eugene's defense claimed that he killed Roxanne in a fit of rage after a constant mistreatment, as if that makes it any more acceptable. Eugene himself explained his actions in a very Eugene way by saying, quote, he wanted to kill the bee for constantly choosing all the other guys over him. It did not take long for the jury to find Eugene guilty, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment, and this time, it was made sure that he did not get out again. Eugene Barrett spent the majority of his sentence in an out-of-state facility in Oklahoma before he was returned to Hawaii, where he died at the Palimomi Medical Center in 2003 of an undisclosed illness. <laughs> That's today's 10-minute murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I appreciate you taking the time to listen today and being a part of the show. And before you scoot out of here, back to your life, or on to the next episode, whatever you're doing, be sure that you are subscribed and connected on social media. If you're really into 10-minute murder and would like to help the show grow, there are a couple of different things you can do. One of them I mentioned at the beginning, and that is telling the people that you know that you think could be into brief stories about true crime tell them about 10 minute murder the other thing is if you listen somewhere and you can rate and review the podcast leave a five-star rating and a review that lets other people know what you like about the podcast doing that is a huge help to me and i will love you forever thank you for listening be safe and make good choices